As is so often the case, the story of the attacker begins with the failure of another aircraft, in this case the supermarine Spiteful. Given how little remembered the attacker itself is, it's saying something that the Spiteful is perhaps even less well known today. The short version of the Spiteful is that the RAF and Supermarine wanted to give the Spitfire greater range, a higher top speed to better combat jets and flying bombs, alongside improved high altitude performance. The solution for this combination of characteristics was to replace the Spitfire's iconic elliptical wing with a laminar flow aerofoil similar to that pioneered by North American with the Mustang. This proved harder than it looked as the secret to the laminar flow wing was really in the precision manufacturing process required to make it, rather than in the design of the wing itself. So delayed was this project, which started in 1942, that the prototype Spiteful didn't take to the air until July 1944, with the first production examples only appearing in the summer of 1945. This was far too late to be of any use in the Second World War. Mass production of the Meteor and Vampire rendered it obsolete. The concurrent development of the Sea Fang, intended to replace the Sea Fire, was also delayed and also failed to result in an active squadron of aircraft. In this case, the successful Sea Fury was the winner, although a number of Sea Fire F Mark 47s, which were heavily influenced by the Sea Fang, would eventually fight in Korea. The Spiteful and Sea Fang were not bad aircraft per se. They were just the end of the line for piston engine fighters at a time when jets were really taking off, if you'll pardon the pun. Putting aside national pride, I think it's also reasonable to suggest that Supermarine had lost their way from an innovation perspective by this point in time. For the most part, they were iterating on old glories by tacking on other people's ideas, and not with any great adeptness. Supermarine did, however, realise that aerodynamically the spiteful design was well suited to a jet fighter. After all, the entire idea had been to increase critical Mach number and reduce drag. Powered by a heavily boosted Rolls-Royce Griffin, the spiteful could hit 494 miles an hour in level flight. As test beds, they gave Supermarine a good few insights into transonic flight. At roughly the same time, in March 1944, Rolls-Royce had begun development of a new, large and powerful centrifugal flow jet engine. If it worked, it would be the most powerful jet engine in the world at the time. So at the end of June 1944, a week before the Spiteful finally flew for the first time, Supermarine secured a development mandate from the Ministry of Aircraft Production to mate the proposed Rolls-Royce turbine with an evolved spiteful airframe. Supermarine's chief designer, the colourfully named Joe Smith, took issue with the diameter of the proposed engine, which would lead to substantial drag. He successfully petitioned Rolls-Royce to reduce its size, ultimately resulting in the Neen, probably the best first-generation jet engine. It is therefore reasonable to state that without the attacker, there would have been no MiG-15, which is a hell of a claim to fame. On the 5th of August 1944, Supermarine got the go-ahead for three prototypes and a static test article, the intention being to use these as carrier fighters. The official instruction was for jet machines of the spiteful type, which I find pleasingly archaic. Timing-wise, this was fully 18 months after McDonnell had been given the contract for the FH-1 Phantom on New Year's Day 1943, but it was nine months ahead of the Banshee, Fury and Pirate, which were contracted in early 1945. All the while, spiteful testing continued, and it was not desperately encouraging. The spiteful's wing did give the aircraft the desired high-altitude performance, but it came at the expense of challenging low-speed stability and very scary spin performance. But despite this, in November 1945, Supermarine got an order for 24 production jet fighters. Any elation they felt would have been short-lived. Ongoing issues with the Spiteful's handling above 400 miles per hour led to the contract for the production being suspended in February 1946. 
18 sea vampires were ordered to familiarise fleet air arm pilots with jets. Development of the attacker prototypes continued, though, and the first aircraft flew on July 27, 1946. So you can align your timelines. Hawker received their contract for prototype Seahawks in May of 1946, although they kept that quiet for some time. Test flying these new jets was always a risky business. In this case, the risks were amplified by combining a new airframe with a new engine. The prototype was the first plane to take the Neen into the air. And just to add to the negative omens, the power unit was the 13th Neen assembled. Remarkably, Chief Test Pilot Jeffrey Quill not only survived, but managed to get it to 542 miles per hour. Later engine installations raised power to 5,000 pounds and speed to 580 miles an hour at sea level. As ever, multiple modifications to the design were made during testing. The resultant attacker was an odd-looking aircraft. Most obviously, it was a tail dragger with the main gear in the wings and a twin wheel at the back under the tail. This led to an unusual approach angle with the nose high, essentially eliminating many of the benefits that jet propulsion allowed in regard to positioning the cockpit in the nose for improved visibility behind the ship and when taxiing. It must be said though that the nose high attitude did provide an amount of useful aerodynamic braking on approach relative to a fighter with tricycle landing gear. Perhaps for this reason no air brakes were fitted to the first prototypes. Unfortunately, the inherent slickness of the design made air brakes a necessity and they were installed from the third prototype onwards. Aerodynamic development in the early jets was a process of trial and error. For example, issues tuning the flaps and rudder dogged the prototypes and the early production models and they were therefore a major source of delays. One real advantage of the tail dragger was that it raised the nose on takeoff, increasing the incidence of the wings and leading to a shorter takeoff run. Given the unreliability of hydraulic catapults and the low power of early jets, this was a definite benefit. On the demerit side, one area in which the attacker's heritage as a piston-engined aircraft remained was in the placement of the main armament. The 420mm hispano suiza Mark Vs were in the wings. Again, this negated the benefits of a jet aircraft by moving the weapons off the centre line into a position in which gun harmonisation mattered. It also complicated ammunition feed, increasing stoppage rate. These issues were compounded in the attacker because the wings flexed during hard manoeuvres, making aiming in a dogfight a matter of luck rather than judgement. Supermarine had sketched out a version of the prototype with fuselage guns, but this had been rejected, perhaps because of the level of deviation it entailed from the spiteful. Over a period of two years, the various issues were ironed out sufficiently that in September 1948, the Admiralty placed an order for 60 Attacker Mark 1s to be delivered at a leisurely pace through to March 1951. As with everything about the miserable Attacker program, there was no time or inclination to celebrate. On the 17th, Lieutenant Tobias King Joyce took off to assess takeoff stability, climbing stall speed, and stick forces per G at 30,000 feet, all with the 270 gallon ventral tank fitted. He was also intending to investigate the critical Mach number effect at Mach 0.79 and at 20,000 feet. Sadly, his aircraft crashed 57 minutes after takeoff due to rudder overbalance. King Joyce had jettisoned the drop tank at 6,000 feet, but the aircraft immediately bunted, throwing him against the canopy roof, which shattered. His helmet was recovered with broken pieces of the canopy embedded in it, suggesting that the pilot was violently thrown against the canopy in the bunt when the ventral tank was jettisoned and that he died of a broken neck due to the force of the impact. Despite this additional setback, the first aircraft was delivered in April 1950 and flown on the 5th of that month. As I'll explain later, that aircraft didn't last long. Six of the initial batch were fitted with bomb beams, making them FB-1s. Illustrating the slow rate of production, the first of these fighter bombers didn't fly until the 7th of January 1952. FB-2 followed FB-1. 
84 were made and they featured increased power from a Neen 7 engine giving 5,100 pounds of thrust. I should say at this point that the Neen series was later redesignated so that Neen 7 became Neen 103, also installed in the Seahawk FB5 and FGA6. Beyond the engine, the FB2 featured an electric starter, tougher metal framed canopy, ability to carry six rockets under the wings and various other improvements. Deliveries began on the 25th of April 1952. Regardless of version, the attacker was a compact fighter, 38 and a half feet long with a span of just under 37 feet. That's two and a half feet shorter than a Seahawk and with two feet less wingspan but actually more or less the same size overall as Grumman's F9 F2 Panther. Wing area was the lowest of its peers, but low weight would give it a lower wing loading than almost all of them. It weighed 8,434 pounds empty, 1,000 pounds less than a Panther and about 800 less than any of the fighter bomber Seahawks. Quoted maximum speed was 590 miles per hour at sea level, but was really more like 580. Initial climb rate was good at 6,350 feet per minute, making it superior to the first iterations of the Seahawk, Panther and Banshee. As we'll come to later though, that initial climb rate tailed off quite quickly and performance above 15,000 feet was unimpressive. Although impressive for the late 40s, by the early 1950s they were not great numbers. Just over 150 of them were delivered to the fleet air arm, 36 were also sold to Pakistan where they served well into the 1960s. The attacker was a disappointment in service. On the plus side, contemporary test pilots rated it as much faster than a vampire and more manoeuvrable than a Meteor F-8 at low altitude and high speed. Those were the good bits. As well as the issues with the armament and basic things like visibility when taxiing and scorching the deck with jet blast, its performance above 30,000 feet proved to be a letdown. Because it differed in configuration from other jets, its value as a conversion trainer was also dubious. Due to manufacturing problems, production models were poorly finished, leading to annoying and sometimes fatal equipment failures. But the fundamental issue with the attacker was the protracted development period. If it had emerged in 1946, then it would have been a revolutionary naval jet fighter further development of which might have resulted in a useful aircraft and service in Korea. But as it was, by 1951 straight wings were approaching obsolescence and the game had moved on substantially. We're essentially talking about an aircraft that was conceptually similar to something like an FJ-1 Fury in that it started out as a modification of a successful piston-engined fighter wing with a new fuselage. Now, the attacker was superior to the Fury, which was a dog, but it was a dog that made its first carrier landing in March 1948 and was phased out by 1950. The attacker wasn't delivered to squadrons until the middle of 1951. For the most part, Fury landings involved the wings coming off or some other calamity, but the fact is that the Fury was theoretically squadron ready three years before the attacker. I shouldn't be too harsh. In any combat situation, the attacker was the superior aircraft. It carried much heavier armament, albeit it was unable to hit much with it. The Fury's only advantage was three times the attacker's 200-odd mile combat radius. But the Fury couldn't actually lift off a carrier deck carrying that much fuel as the tip tanks would pull the wings off. So there's that. Essentially what I'm saying is that although late, the attacker was better than the second worst carrier fighter of the era. It was also basically superior to the FH-1 Phantom by virtue of 50 miles per hour more speed. But again, it should have been better. The Phantom made its first carrier landing in 1946 and was a clean sheet prototype design. It led to the Banshee, which was better resolved and thus far more useful than the attacker. Obsolete well before its service entry, the attacker only went to sea on a handful of occasions and was phased out of active service in 1954. 800 Squadron started converting to the type in August 1951 and then initially took eight F-1s onto Eagle in March 1952, staying with the ship until 1954 
eventually building up to 12 aircraft before they traded up to Seahawks. 803 Squadron also got eight attackers on its formation in November 1951. Again, they eventually got to 12 aircraft and went on to deploy to Albion and Centaur before they disbanded in November 1955. So out of 146 aircraft, only about two dozen ever went aboard a carrier. Reserve squadrons also gave up the type in 1956, as Seahawks that had replaced the attacker on the carriers were themselves relegated to the reserves. Pakistan soldiered on with its small number of attackers until the mid-1960s, and they apparently saw some service against India, carrying two 1,000-pound bombs in a strike roll off land bases. Going back through the accident records gives a sense of the teething problems and the dangers that came with operating even a relatively sedate early jet. These accidents started with the very first production example. On the 23rd of May 1950, a Vickers test pilot was carrying out high-speed tests when the outer portion of the starboard wing folded up and the ailerons became locked. He decided not to eject and managed to do a high-speed landing. Others were less lucky. On the 5th of February 1951, squadron leader Peter Roberts was flying the third production attacker, hoping to prove pressurization and effect on performance of the ventral fuel tank. Puffs of black smoke were seen in the jet exhaust as it took off. The aircraft was next seen at high speed pulling out of a dive, then rolling inverted before impacting the ground at well over 500 miles an hour. Roberts was 35 when he died. And so we go on. On the 23rd of May 1953, a Tuesday for the record, two attackers collided in mid-air over Siddlesham near Chichester on the south coast of England. The wreckage fell on greenhouses and cornfields. Lieutenant Commander John Glazer and Lieutenant Francis Bailey, both of 803 Squadron on Eagle, were killed. Neither had attempted to eject. A later inquest suggested that Bailey, in the trailing aircraft, had made a climbing turn as Glazer began a dive. One of those misjudgments to which we are all prone was the assessment of the Chichester coroner. Between May and August 1954, no less than five attackers were lost on Malta with two fatalities. Lieutenant John Stock and Sub-Lieutenant Geoffrey Finch were killed in the second of a pair of mid-air collisions. Some incidents were just one of those things. On the 10th of November 1955, Lieutenant Commander Lavender of the Royal Navy Reserve was forced to take violent evasive action at Stretton to avoid a sea prince. He hit the ground 400 metres from the field and was killed. I believe that the last British pilot killed in an attacker was Lieutenant Jack Wyatt, who crashed after a wave-off during a mirror landing practice at Naval Air Station Ford on the 26th of June 1956. In total, I've found 19 accidents in production attackers that resulted in the aircraft being written off entirely. Twelve pilots were killed in these incidents. Only two occurred when the aircraft was deployed on a carrier, one fatal accident due to a stall after launch, and the other an aircraft written off in a barrier crash. 13% of the fleet were written off in five years, which isn't actually all that bad for the period albeit most of the accidents happened in training rather than in a more intense operational context. Six aircraft and four pilots were killed in mid-air collisions and another was killed avoiding such a collision, which seems pretty high and perhaps reflects the challenges of learning to fly formation in a fast and relatively unmanoeuvrable fighter. It perhaps won't surprise you that the attacker never saw combat service even though it was deploying to squadrons at the time that the Korean War began. The fleet air arm decided against sending it, despite the fact that fleet defence was at that time handled by obsolete Sea Fire Mark 47s. The attacker offered more than 100 miles per hour more speed, a little more range, and the same armament. Why they weren't sent isn't entirely clear. To a degree, there was limited benefit in upgrading from the Sea Fires, as neither type would have been particularly effective against the MiG-15, and the Sea Fury proved more than capable of defending itself in any case. The Sea Fire was marginally smaller than the attacker, and therefore took up less hangar space. There's also the fact that the two carriers that carried the bulk of the fleet air arm effort in Korea were Ocean and Theseus, both of the Colossus class. 
Attackers initially deployed to the larger Eagle and then went on to Albion and Bulwark, both of the modern Centaur class of light fleet carriers. Perhaps there were concerns about deploying an untested weapon on a smaller, older carrier. But this is all supposition and flies in the face of the fact that Ocean was actually the carrier used for the first ever jet carrier landing. One way or another, the attacker didn't head out to Asia, and I don't believe it made any deployments to the Far East in its service life with the fleet air arm. By the time Suez came around, it was firmly relegated to the corner of the reserve hangars. Hence, we never found out whether it would have been much use in combat. Realistically, its poor quality as a gun platform would have limited its usefulness for strafing and close support. Short range would have made it less than effective as an interdictor. Even the Seahawk had an extra 100 miles over the attacker when carrying tanks and bombs. Poor aerodynamics meant that it was only really competitive in a dogfight at low level and simply couldn't operate successfully above 30,000 feet. This conclusion goes slightly against the raw statistics of the attacker. As ever, statistics don't tell the whole story. Supermarine were not perturbed by this lack of success. They continued to develop the concept, eventually leading to the Swift for the RAF and the Scimitar for the Navy, but those are other stories. Hopefully this brief trot through the Supermarine attacker has given you a sense of the aircraft and why it failed. More importantly, in my view, I hope I've provided an insight into the dangers faced by fleet air arm pilots at the dawn of the jet age and the issues faced by the British aviation industry as it tried and generally failed to recapture the enterprising spirit of the 1930s. Thanks for watching. If you have any more insights or thoughts, and I'd love to hear them in the comments. If you've enjoyed the video, then please subscribe. It really helps the channel.